Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for braving the, um, the impending weather outside and for faculty, the uh, mount mounting numbers of papers, I'm sure, that are accumulating on people's desks uh, and students who have undoubtedly have to do some studying. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce today uh, Michelle Hammond, who's our first finalist for Dean of University Libraries and Archives. Um, uh, we scheduled this session to include two equal parts. For the first portion, we've invited Ms. Hammond to speak to how she views core services in libraries and archives developing in the coming years. And in the second portion, we'll, we'll be having an open questions and answer session to ask any questions you might have of the candidate. So with that, I hope you'll join me in please welcoming Mrs. Michelle Hammond. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I'm sure I'm gonna make the uh, cameraman upset because I'm a mover. <laughs> so um, thank you so much, students, faculty, uh, staff, um, any additional guests we may have. I really appreciate you being here because I know this is a crazy time for everybody. So I'll try to make it short and sweet and brief. How about that? Give you some time to, to interact. Um, I want to start by kind of uh, looking at looking at the question. And forgive me, I'm going to leave this up in this format. I'm not going to do a full format for you, just so I can have some ability to move back and forth. So let's look at the question. Once core services and functions, changing needs of constituents, and improvement. That's improvements. That's the distillation uh, of the question. So. Um, Let's kind of approach this by what every librarian does, and that's creating an acronym. <laughs> CCI, so we can kind of stay focused on what we're looking at. So core services, I'm going to spend a lot of time in changing needs of the constituency. And then we're going to look at the end <clears throat> very quickly at improvements, um, and then give you some time to talk. So, so my, so CCI, I was going to write that somewhere, so write that in your brain. CCI, <laughs> core services, changing needs of constituents, and improvements. When I look at core services, I see a lot of things. I see a plethora of things, but the primary things that I think we should focus on is collecting rich and relevant resources. Number two, access. Resource access, <coughs> ground access, and virtual access to books, and these days, rare materials and uh, scholarly content, uh, various digital materials having access, right? But underneath that number two is IT infrastructure, readily and in turn, in a very, structurally important to having this access. So number three, expert support. Librarians and various sundry staff helping to find and navigate the rich and relevant resources. Those are the three core services. Now, bear with me, if you will. I'm gonna look at this kind of in a historical timeline way. So bear with me while I jump through various parts of time. Let's go all the way back. Changing needs. Do you remember? <laughs> Stella, <laughs> tablets. That's when we first started having information. This guy's back is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking already, we've got to find another way to do this. We've got to change how we're doing this. You know, this information is increasing. My back is going to be gone in about five years. We've got to find new ways, right? So needing to find new ways of doing things goes back to 7,000 BC. So let's jump on the timeline up to about 290 BC. You've got scrolls, you've got papyrus, you've got leather holdings, you've got scholars who are accessing this now. You don't have the workers necessarily totally involved in the access. 
Now the user themselves is actually involved in access, primarily scholars, right? Jump to the Gutenberg in Punabula, early manuscripts, 1400s, 1500s, changing needs. Now we finally get to the book, right? Easy access, easy construction, um, changing needs, meeting the changing needs. Let's move now to the United States, 1731. The Library Company of Philadelphia, the origins of private libraries, right? So we have out of scholars, and then with the Gutenberg, our clergy, now we have the population needing, the general population needing to get to information. And so we have the origin of private libraries. Jumping now in time, we go from private to public. First public library in the United States, 1833. Peterborough, New Hampshire. Uh, and around the same time, a similar time frame, uh, the Public Library Act happened in Britain in 1850. And that's <coughs> actually a picture of Peterborough. I, I've been hanging out in New Hampshire here lately, and so I've been in their libraries all over the place. And I got a picture of the Peterborough Library. Um, changing needs, now we're opening up to the populace. Now, let's move to 1880. <coughs> technology. <laughs> what was the technology in 1880? Oh, I'm actually interactive too. <laughs> <laughs> Electricity. And we had to figure out a way. I, imagine. The users only had access to the library and library materials from sun up to sun down. And then you had an extension of access, right, to those services with the advent of this new technology called electricity. But notice how it's in there. Do you see this? Mm -hmm. They have these wires hanging all through the top and hanging things down. It's, you know, very haphazard, right? But we've got to have light, right? Because we're extending our services past the traditional time. So we had a changing need. We had a technology coming in, electricity. And we made a way for it, albeit a little um, clumsy. But we, we did it. Similarly, you know, here's the congressional reading room. And now the lamps. I don't know if you can really see this. So sorry with the lamps have become a standard part. We figured out a way to standardize that in a way that's a very much a part of the infrastructure, right? Take that same room to 2006, and now lighting is inculcated into the walls and part of how we are providing that new technology, right? Stay high with me on the concept. <laughs> okay. Now, New York Public. Same kinds of structures of that reading room. Same lamps are here and boom, what do you see? Now we're integrating even more these uh, sources for having power. Because why? New technology, right? And we're retrofitting in our renovations and uh, creating new spaces based on these new things that are coming into our space, right? Because we have these multiplicity of plugs for increased devices and more devices <laughs> and more devices and more devices. Now, Boston Public. Remember the 1880s photo? Lights hanging all over the place? Because we needed that new technology, right? Same thing is happening underneath these tables. There's a gob of stuff going on underneath. Because we're making sure that we can integrate 
all of these new things that students are bringing into the space. Right? Now, another thing that I think is important, light, light, and more light. This was actually our original institution, the library. Very dark building. And they, in 2008, built a new one, floor to ceiling lights on four floors. Uh, floor to ceiling uh, openings, windows, on all floors. Because light, light, and more light became a need, right? Another need, creative spaces within our library space, okay? So we have light and we have artistic space, yes? Now, in the changing needs, one of the things I think is very important is that we always inquire. So improvement number one is staying on the pulse of your user. In 2007, there was a questionnaire that was given to millennials. Um, and you can look in the Catherine Green book information to look at how academic libraries looked at futuring. They asked these questions, they got responses back. The question was, how do you envision your 2010 library? And this is what resulted, okay? So what's important for me is constant inquiry into what the students need and how they're functioning, right? So let's explore this for just a couple of seconds. What would you like to know first? We learn from you, right? That means the librarians are actually not just in a teaching role, but in a learning role, openly. They're okay with learning the new things from the student population. Um, we advise. We connect. Coffee, too. <laughs> you laugh, but it's critically important. <laughs> because we have to be comfortable in those spaces that we learn, where we learn. Um, your access, right? Students are where? Sorry, I, le I left my phone. But students are where? In the phone. Okay, so how can we access you in this space? And can we ask, access your materials, back to access, right, in our space? And we broadcast. And we have books for you. That would seem obvious, books for you. What does that really mean, books for you? Now this is where I'm going to be interactive. Someone have to tell me, what do they mean by saying books for you? Because that seems kind of obvious. Electronic books. E-books? Okay. How about books that are relevant? We have books for you that you actually need, right? I think a lot of that is what they were saying as well. Um, so I think it's important for us to really dig into our population, our student population, determine what they want, and make the necessary changes to materials based on those needs. So gone are the days of our librarian as Sage on stage, Sage behind books, to a very interactive, uh, one thing I heard from our students when we kind of reached out to them was, we need you to be there when we want you and when we need you. Ms. Hammond, you're not there when we need you. So we actually instituted a text to librarian service. So that up until the time that I pass out at the end of the night, you know, students are contacting us. And we're able to get back to them with specific answers about our materials, our resources, um, on their time. And so wonderful statistics on that usage as well. So another thing, it's important to look at what you are already doing great. Now, for the library staff, and I, I see so many things that are great. Your Wednesday workshops, that's answering the, I, we need you to talk to us, right? The new multi-touch table on the second floor. The 3D printer, so 
joined the maker, makerspace movement. The commons, light, light, more light, pizza, free snacks, 24 seven access, and the flute choir. Seems odd, but I think the integration of the arts in the library space, which a lot of people don't necessarily agree with, is critical to learning at another level. Yes? Corrugated furniture on the fourth floor <coughs> while waiting for reno. Artistic, right? Creative space. Uh, couches, wheels on comfy chairs. Sci-fi book talks. You know, if, does anyone remember the name of the gentleman who created the Oculus the 3D headset that's coming out? I'm sure that his library had sci-fi book talks, potentially, <coughs> to get his mind wrapped <coughs> around this new layer of technology that he created, okay? So between the flute choir and the sci-fi book talks, you're creating a creative space where it's not just books, but there's interaction, yes? Uh, I, I love the Leave Your Legacy program. Uh, and I left this for last because I thought that was great. The focus on stress relief. Come pet the dog in the comments. Make a mandala and make a stress ball. Come color. All things that are supporting the student, not just coming to the space uh, to take a book, but to have an experience. Okay? And when you have intellectual experiences, that's when thinking and learning moves to another level. Okay. Last but not least, let's look at some improvements. So, take stock in the current strengths, actively listening to the patron community. Make sure you're aligning resource purchases with faculty content delivery. That's a big one for me. Uh, invest heavily in IT infrastructure network to support all of these growing technology integrations, yes? Database expansion based on much higher faculty interaction and integration. Uh, movement of the librarian into more integrated teaching, number five. Number six, fully exploring open access. You already have thomas.gov on your website. Uh, I think there's a whole world of open access materials that you could bring into your resource, um, cadre of resources. And last but not least, um, uh, no, we're not quite there, communicating internally and externally, and integrating and continuing to grow uh, this iterative process. Because it's a, it's a wheel. It's us having conversations with faculty, it's us having conversations with students, and we're making decisions based on all of that interaction and it's iterative and it's consistent. Regarding expert support, survey what access times we're missing for our students and then be there when we need you, okay? That's kind of a close on my improvements, but in terms of futuring in libraries, I wanted to kind of let you see a wonderful clip that we we'll kind of give you a little insight. Bear with me. Anybody familiar with the time machine? The movie? Yes, students? Not yet? No? Okay. I think I'm okay with audio, so I'm gonna see if this works. What are you? I'm the Fifth Avenue Public Library Information Boss Registration NY. That's what I'm looking for. Oh, man. Very often. Very often. Oh, no, sir. I am a third generation fusion rod photonic with verbal and visual link capabilities connected to every database on the planet. Photonic. A compendium of all human knowledge. Area of inquiry? You know anything about physics? Ah, access to physics. Mechanical engineering. Dimensional optics. Chronography. Time travel? Yes. Accessing science fiction? No, no, practical application. My question is why can't one change the past? 
because one cannot travel into the past. Mm -hmm. Well, if one could. One cannot. Uh, excuse me, this, this is something you should trust me on. Accessing the writings of Isaac Asimov, H.G. Wells, Paul Ellison, Alexander Hardy. Oh, tell me about him. Alexander Hardy, 1869 to 1903, American scientist given to eccentric postulation. Found writings include a treatise on the creation of a time machine. Time machine. Time machine was written by H.C. Wells in 1894. It was later adapted to a motion picture by George Powell and a stage musical by Andy Lloyd Webber, which no, went that's not what I mean. in years. Would you like to be selected from the score? No. There's a place called tomorrow, a place of joy. Not a song. <laughs> it's a place for you. It's a place for you. It's a place for you. Will there be anything else? Uh, no. No, I. I think I'll have better luck than 200 years. But it's possible. Mm -hmm. Access. Future. What will it look like? How will we do it? We get ideas from the science fiction. And we figure out ways to enter it. And be iterative. And get to tomorrow. Thank you. That's what we all really are trying to get and find good data, mm -hmm. not just all of it. We want to sort it out. Okay. So. Okay. So having intelligent algorithms, sort of like what Google has been doing with uh, a lot of their engineers who write the algorithms, uh, how can that happen in the academic space where we get a more directed Material. I, I hear a lot of students always say, you know, I'm not going in that database. It just doesn't give me what I want. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we've got to find some smarter things in the background to, to assist. Right. Anything else? Anyone else? How would you yeah. engage faculty? So when you're here, when librarians are hearing what the homework assignment is at the 11 clock hour from the student, if you had only known that this was coming kind of question, um, that you could be ready, how would you engage faculty? That's a wonderful question. Part of what we did at Johns Hopkins was to collect syllabi and have conversations with faculty on the regular. Um, to have a good understanding, particularly those, you know, if you learn one semester how to prepare for the next. Right? But we had the syllabus project where we were ongoing and iterative again, having these conversations and understanding the um, assignments beforehand. So I think it's a matter of librarians engaging and having the material. And when you have things come in at the ninth hour that you know are going to come next semester at the ninth hour, you really get into those assignments. Everyone on staff understands them and everybody's ready. And then the students look at you like you're just, wow, you guys are really smart. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of prepare for this. <laughs> yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing it. I've been doing that at more than, yeah. 
trying to. Any other questions? Well, well, if not, I thank you. You have a wonderful space. You have wonderful uh, students and a wonderful environment. And thank you for having me.